going to be a differential. Okay, there's going to be a differential between the dry bulb and the wet bulb in all conditions except for one 100% humidity. Condensation occurs at the dew point. Okay? When you've got a glass of iced tea in the summer, the moisture forms on it. Okay? That's you know, condensation. You can make condensation occur as long as you get that surface temperature to whatever the dew point of the air is. So when we've got a really high dew point during the summer, 72, 75 degrees sometimes, you could go to your tap, get 68 degree water out of your tap, and set it and dew will form on it. It's kind of a weird thing to think about, but it doesn't take a whole lot of cool when the uh, humidity is very elevated. Relative humidity, you know, percentages are always a ratio of something, okay? So it's the amount of moisture measured in grains per pound of dry air over the amount it can hold, whatever the absolute holding capacity of that is. The other way to think about it is, um, if anybody in here likes to cook, you can dissolve more salt or sugar in water at high temperatures than at low temperatures. Air is the same way. It can hold more moisture at high temperatures than at low. So as the air gets warmer, it can hold more moisture. But if the amount of moisture didn't change, the relative humidity will actually drop. If you kept the amount of moisture in the air constant and started dropping the temperature, the denominator drops and the relative humidity rises. We spend a lot of time on that because it is counterintuitive. Uh, so there's twice as much moisture in the air at 100% relative humidity as there is at 50% relative humidity at any given temperature. Yesterday morning we had fog. That meant the overnight relative humidity was 100%. That's the air, and if uh, basically the water could hold no more salt. So fog starts to fall out of the air when the, when the um, uh, uh, meteorologist says, you know, the fog's gonna burn off around 10. That means enough sunlight has warmed up the earth. So we started, the, the holding capacity of air increased and that fog was able to be reabsorbed into the air. Okay, humidity ratio is kind of like a sponge. Again, how much absolute moisture can the air hold? Okay, the psychometric chart. Any questions about any of those definitions? Everybody on board with those? Okay. If I stand up here and just talk for four hours, we're all gonna be really bored, so. Please jump in at any point in time. So we're gonna build the psychometric chart. This is the amount of moisture in grains per pound of dry air that can be held at any given temperature. This is the maximum holding capacity. So if we plotted those on an XY graph, grains per pound of dry air at the Y axis, dry bulb temperature along the X axis, it starts to look like that, okay? may start to look like the chart in front of you. Okay. That's our 100% relative humidity curve. If that's the most it can hold, then if it's holding that much, it is 100% relative humidity. Okay. So if we just fraction out at each point, 90% of that point, all the way down, that's the 90% relative humidity. With 30% of that holding, we're on the 30% relative humidity line. So each of those follows the 100% line um, uh, at, a, at a given ratio, at a given dry bulb. If we look at any point, uh, there should be a dot in the middle, probably somewhere around 80, 67, 78, 65, something like that. Okay? At any given point on there, there should be some lines intersecting. The horizontal line, you measure and read over off to the right, that is your humidity ratio in dry bulb. Two different, two different measurements, but it, they're along the same line. Okay, your wet bulb line comes in on a diagonal. Your dry bulb is on a vertical, and your relative humidity is on an arc. Everybody follow all the, all the roads we've got? 
If that's a road map, this is our compass. If we have, if we're humidifying, if we're adding moisture to the air, we go up. If we're dehumidifying, we go down. If we're heating, we go right. If we're cooling, we go left. Okay. So as we're cooling, we're going to come down. We'll hit the saturation line, okay? And we stop. If we're heating, we can go on forever. Not blue. <laughs> True story. Um, so there it is fully built out. This one's in Celsius because somebody's weird. Okay, there's another set of lines on there. Okay, these are the specific volume lines. So if you, air has weight to it, even though it's weird to think about, but if you had a box and you managed to get a pound of air inside that box, okay, and that air was at this condition, okay, it would have 13 and a half cubic feet of volume for that pound of air. If we start heating that air, it starts filling up, okay? If that was a balloon, instead of being 13 and a half, it would be 14 cubic feet. Keep going, it'll be 14 and a half. The most common application of that is if your wife always complains that her tires got low because it got cold outside, the opposite happened. You filled her tires up when it was 100 degrees outside and then it cooled off to 65 or 60 or 55. It sat in the cold garage or in the driveway. She got in and got a low tire pressure sensor. That's all that happened, hopefully. Either, yeah, that, it, either that or there's a nail in there. Had it this week. So, my wife too. Um, Everybody makes a psychrometric chart. They're all relatively the same. This one's my favorite. Um, it's by a company out of um, Minnesota that builds dehumidification equipment. So a couple of mine up here are gonna look like this. It's no different than yours. It's no different than carriers, right? The, the math's the same. The presentation of it's a little bit different sometimes. Um, some people, instead of using grains of moisture per pound of dry air, use pound of moisture per pound of dry air, it makes it a very, very small number, like 0 .0023 or something like that. I don't like really small numbers, um, so I like grains of moisture. Grains of moisture, what is it, like 770 grains per pound of water? 7, right? I'm sorry, 7,000? Based on, on barley. Yeah. Based on barley? Is that where it came from? I believe so. There we 7, go. 7,000 grains of barley make one pound. Learn? Well, I'm going. I learned. I've verified that before. Before you go around? Before you use me as a source. So that makes me happy because I like beer. Okay. So again, what what's happening in here, if you're walking up to a building and there's uh, and the windows look like this, what's happening? What's happening if the moisture is on the inside? Colder on the outside, yeah. Colder on the outside, outside temperatures below space dew point. Inverse is true. If it's happening on the outside, inside temperatures below outside dew point. You can find everything about a piece, about an air in a given condition, as long as you start with two pieces of information. We are diagnosing a humidity problem and you come back and tell me that the space is 68 degrees, that does not help, right? Because it could be anywhere on the 68 degree line. But if you know that it was 60, if you know that it was 90 and whatever point this is, then we know the wet bulb temperature, we know how much enthalpy's in the air, we'll get to enthalpy, we know a whole lot of stuff, but we have to have two points to find it on the map. Like a longitude and latitude. But you got a lot of options. Okay, finding points on a psychometric chart. Find 81, 59, mark it with your marker, and write down what you think the dew point, humidity ratio, percent RH, and enthalpy are.
Everybody good? Anybody need a little more time? Okay. Anyone want to share what they found? I'll give it a shot. All right. I got 45 dew point. I'm good with that. 43. Yeah, I got. It's a big dot. I was was at 43. Yeah, 43. I'm good with that. Yeah, and I had 45 on my humidity ratio. That's that corresponds with finding 45 on dew point. I'm good with that. Yeah. Then, then I had 50 percent on my humidity though. So that's way off. And 27 on my enthalpy. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else's numbers look dramatically different from this? Okay. So let's just let's just go how we how we do this. Everybody find 82.59 reasonably well. So we read 82 up off the dry bulb. We read 59 by finding 60 and going eh, a little bit down. Right? It's kind of a judgment call. If we want to be really specific, we use a program. If you're looking at quick rough calculations, just quick understanding of what's going on with the air, we use the side chart. So if you're off by two points, we're good. Okay. So we're here. So first thing we read is dew point. We read that over here. So here's the 45, two ticks down for me, that was 43. Okay, and then I read, what I say, 42 grains. Again, here's 40 to 50, so each hash mark is 42. <coughs> So 42-ish percent RH. We're between the 20 and 30 percent RH curves. So we're going to be somewhere in that realm, a little north of this 25. Okay. So I've got 27. And then enthalpy, while not perfectly parallel, the wet bulb <coughs> lines and the enthalpy lines are really, really, really close. So there is nothing wrong with following this wet bulb line up and reading 26. Okay. Everybody still okay? All right. So let's talk about these properties there if they're in terms of weather. I'm going to use two values. Remember when we first built out uh, the graph, we plotted dry bulb along the bottom, we plotted uh, humidity ratio up the side, although they put it over here like a traditional graph. Okay? So those are your x and y axis, so I call, call those our absolute values. Since dew point temperature falls on the exact same axis, call it, just take along with that as well. Wet bulb, relative humidity, and enthalpy are hybrid values, right? We, we read them on an angle, we need the other two to kind of orient us where we are. So they're neither true measures of dry bulb or moisture in the air, but they're uh, a hybrid of the two. When we talk about weather, dry bulb is going to change the most quickly. Okay? Every morning the sun comes up, starts warming the earth. Every evening it goes down, the earth starts cooling, or at least our little corner of it. Dew point temperature and humidity ratio change very slowly. They only change when you see a weather front move through, okay? Otherwise, it's gonna be pretty constant. So, if these are hybrids of the two, they're not going to move as fast as dry bulb, but they're not gonna move as slow as dew point, okay? So your range of wet bulb during the day is going to be much less than your range of humidity ratio. I'm sorry, less than your range of dry bulb, but more than your range of humidity ratio. We're going to move through those. That makes sense to everybody? Let's go back over it. <clears throat> when you get up in the morning, if you don't have a front or any kind of major change in the weather, the dew point is going to remain rather constant. Because the amount of water or moisture in the air remains the same. Exactly. That's correct. But humidity the actual relative humidity will change with the dry bulb because it's how much moisture warmer air can hold as opposed to cooler air. So as the sun warms the air up, it has the capacity to has the capacity hold, hold more, more, more moisture. Therefore, the relative humidity goes down. Yeah. 
And I'm going to say this, and, and you're going to say this later again. But when you hear somebody say it's 95 outside with 95% relative humidity, that's impossible. Okay. As the temperature goes up, the relative humidity goes down. You'd be dead. Everyone would be dead in the street if it was 95 degrees with 95% relative humidity. You've heard 100 with 100% relative humidity? That's freaking incredible. Not gonna happen. <laughs> not gonna even in the even in the worst place on earth. That's not gonna happen. Or nobody could even survive it. I'll leave it at that. that feels like. <laughs> well, the, the term relative humidity means it's relative to it's relative to how much the, the air can hold, and the air can it can hold more moisture. Therefore, the ratio is lower as the temperature goes up. Yeah, I've seen that on outdoor air units to be like real low, you know, 105 outside, humidity maybe 10 percent or somewhere low, and then the guys complaining it's 70 percent humidity in this room or 65. You know, I want 55. Well, it depends on how that machine is treating the air too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll definitely get into the applications piece of all of that. I'm sorry, I mean, no, that's object, okay. But that's that's and talking about impossibility. So I don't want to hear anybody say 95 degrees with 95 percent real humidity. If you guys a class, it's impossible. Okay, so we're going to pretend it's summertime in Houston, and the overnight low was 72 degrees. There was no fog that formed. There's no major weather changes that happened during the day, and the daytime high was 95 degrees. Okay? Find dew point temperature and humidity ratio. It should stay the same. The peak wet ball temperature during the day, the peak RH during uh, the percent RH at the peak temperature, and the change of enthalpy during the, from morning to, to uh, from the low to the high. Question makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. Everybody. So, no, that's fine. So the overnight low is 72, but fog didn't form. Okay. We know that the relative humidity wasn't 100%, right? What does it feel like when you guys get in your vans first thing in the morning during the summer? Muggy. Mm -hmm. Muggy. So maybe not 100% humidity, but 90. 90, 95. Pick a point. So you're going to be along 72, somewhere in that 90 to 95 range is your starting point. And then you're going to warm that air up to 95 degrees. So we could conceivably give a number of 68 or 70, 70 dew point. Let's just use 70 as a dew point. I don't remember what I used. I used dew point of 70. Good pick. I'm just, I'm just saying that it's going to feel like it's really humid because, but it's not 100 percent. Or it would be 72 degrees dew point. Right. I'm going to get the outside temperatures here in a second. Love we'll it. Uh, No cheating looking at the next slide. <laughs> oh, good idea. <laughs>
Well, what about a cooling tower? If you're inside of a cooling tower, <laughs> you shouldn't be You should not be inside a cooling tower. Uh, well, you <laughs> you know, I've worked on them before. I've worked on them before. Be in there when they're when they're dumping water in there, uh -huh. it's steam is coming out, the fan's mm -hmm. not working, that's why you're in there. But <laughs> it's 95 degrees, Never it's 100 degrees there. in there, and the relative humidity is 100% because the steam is coming up. That's a man-made effect. <laughs> yeah, what about that? That is, that is a man-made effect, um, and it is not 95 degrees in there. Well... It'd be the wet bulb, whatever that is. That's exactly right. So cooling, we'll talk about um, design conditions for various types of equipment in a little bit. Um, and basically, yeah, the cooling tower is limited by the wet bulb. So um, but I, there is a, uh, I wish I knew offhand what building it was downtown, but they have a built up cooling tower that you actually walk into and there's like a service path. Um, there's like three giant cells to your right and three giant cells to your left, but you're, but it's all open air, um, but there's like safety <coughs> cage type of thing. You go in there and you walk up to get up to the hot tub. <coughs> and I was there during the last summer and it was, you know, 95, 100 degrees on the roof. You stepped in there and initially it felt cool because the ambient air temperature dropped like a rock. Yeah. But once you stayed in there for a little while, you realized yeah. that you weren't perspiring it. You were perspiring, but it wasn't evaporating anymore. Yeah. So it initially felt cool, but the more time you spent in there, the hotter you got because you couldn't evaporate anything because the air was fully saturated. So your body temperature would still be 98, 99. <laughs> Yeah, so you walk in, it feels cool, but pretty soon afterwards it stops feeling cool. Everybody ready? Okay. So I plotted at 95% RH, okay, off of 72 degrees. And then I followed this basically 110 um, grains of moisture line over to 95 degrees. So I read a peak wet bulb temperature of 77. Mm -hmm. I read the 110, I read 70 for my dew point. Mm -hmm. I'm about halfway between the 40 and 50 percent RH line, so I read 45. And then I came up here I read 34, 40, which gives me a change in enthalpy of 6. I might have it, a fatter marker than you. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. totally got, fine. Yeah, my, okay, I went at 44% humidity. My, my change at peak was 8 BTU. I think that trended a little under 35. <laughs> okay. And then got up to what I perceived to be 42, just a hair under, so a little less than 8 and change. <clears throat> It could be my eyes and marker, though. Yeah. Remember, <clears throat> what, what we're getting comfortable with is the idea, the concept, and what's roughly happening. If we were designing a piece of equipment for a specific application, we would use a digital one that measures to the third decimal place. I mean, we can be absurdly accurate. This is for you guys in the field to be able to take these psych charts with you and go, Okay, I've got air coming across this cooling coil. I knew it was coming in at this. It's leaving at this. You know, does that look right? Well, if they wanted it to be here, can it even get there? No, this piece of equipment, as it's operating, can't reach the condition of trying to ask of it. Right? And we'll get to that. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Okay, so everybody feel comfortable with how we, how the sun warms? And what happened? Percent RH dropped. We started as humid as we could almost possibly get, and we end up with relative humidity of 45%. On the question, I get how to plot it, yeah. but how did he get to 70 uh, dew point? Because uh, I know it takes at least two, 
two points to, and we can find any uh, any plot. But from the seven, from the question, seventy-two yeah. degrees and ninety-five. How did he uh, get to seventy? So it was. I knew I wasn't going to. I was going to get a variety of different answers. Mm -hmm. But what I was looking for was the idea that when you wake up in the morning in the summer in Houston, humidity is above 90%, okay? It feels muggy, but if there's no fog, you know it's not 100, so it's somewhere in that range. Okay, between. Uh, right? If, if somebody had said the overnight relative humidity was 40, I'd have concerns, right? 40%, that, we don't get that. That would be really nice. It'd be nice to sit out on our back porches and, 70 degrees and 40% RH and have a bonfire. We don't get that, okay? It's muggy, nobody wants to be out there. Fair? Yeah. Okay. And I knew it was a little tricky, that's why I asked if everybody was on board with the question. All right, so this goes to, to Mark's earlier. Mm -hmm. I hear people say that Houston in the summertime is 95 and 95%. What's that wet bulb condition? What would the wet bulb be? 95 and 95. 95 and 95. What would the wet bulb be? <laughs> First one to have an answer, raise your hand. I'll give you $100. What? Is it chart the chart doesn't go that high. It's a pretty safe bet. It's okay. called a humanity chart. It's where <laughs> humans can live. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So is it reasonable? Of course not. Why do people say it? Because when you wake up in the morning, it's 95% humidity and the daytime high was 95. And people who don't understand the ratio of how that moves go, it's 95% humidity and the daytime high was 95. Therefore, there it is. There it is. Too bad, okay. not gonna happen. Not gonna happen. Thank God. I know we're not ready for I, this, but I, I threw up what it is this morning. I want to do uh -huh. it lighter. I'm going to do it lighter so we can plot this twice. Perfect. I love it. And another thing I want you to know is, is can, we'll find out later whether or not this is, you can use the outside air to cool a building based on these numbers. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that later in this, because you're going to talk about that later. So I, I didn't talk about economizers, but we absolutely No, we're can. going to talk about what's possible as far as what what the, the change is, what's going to happen indoors with the mixed air. <coughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. So that's, we're talking about mixed air, and if we mix this temperature, if we put in nothing but outside air, we're going to find out whether this is good air to put in the building and not run any mechanical cooling. Okay? So this gets to kind of our cooling towers discussion. Okay? Design conditions in use. When an engineer is specifying a piece of equipment, a cooling tower, they're going to give something between 78 and 80 for the design wet bulb condition of the tower. Basically that's saying you need to be able to evaporate moisture and cool this condenser water against 78 or 80 degree wet bulb. Okay. It's no different, although slightly different, it's just a little different than the air cooled equipment that is be rated between 95 and 105. Okay. So I just plotted those as lines. Okay. So, that is, whether it's a condensing unit or a rooftop unit, the engineer is saying the ambient condition at peak is going to be 95 or 105. You need to be able to reject heat to ambient and provide the amount of cooling required. Okay. So. Let's talk about that in just a second because here in Houston, we have to have a cooling tower three times bigger than Phoenix. in order to do the same amount of heat rejection for cooling tower. <laughs> because their cooling tower, the cooling tower here, we have a wet bulb dew point scenario that is so high here all the time. Phoenix, Arizona, you get nosebleed. It's so dry. Yeah, we, we can add more water to the air in Phoenix than we can. Absolutely. It, has the, it has the ability to absorb more if, as the tower is giving it off, whereas here, there's a lot more swamp in the air, so the rejection is a lot more difficult and takes more time to accomplish that. If you can make the air here as dry as it is there, when you get out of the shower, you'll need to get a towel pretty damn quick there, or you're going to freeze your nipples off, okay? Because 
it gets really cold because it evaporates very rapidly into the dry air. Yeah, no coasters required. <coughs> I'm, all I'm doing, I'm just telling you a fact. I mean, if you've ever done this in a dry climate, you get out of the shower, you get out of the swimming pool, you better get a towel pretty quick because you're going to get cold. It's going to vaporize so fast that you're going to get goosebumps coming out of the water because you're, it's going to dry, it's going to wet. The wetness on your body is going to dry so fast. Cooling. It's going to cool you so fast you just won't believe it. Well, here we can get out a swimming pool and stand around, no towel. In fact, we don't want a towel. We're trying to stay cool. We're trying to vaporize. And we're still not going to get any better than what the wet pool capability is. And your pool in Phoenix would probably be cooler at the same dry water temperature in Phoenix as it would be in Houston. Well, it depends. Well, there's a lot of factors in there. I'm going to leave that alone because. Yeah. It depends on how much threshing around you do in the water and well, so on and so I'm, forth. I'm, I'm, because I'm, then that would be more vaporized water in the pool means the pool's gonna, the pool's gonna get cooler as well. So, so two, two thoughts on that. One, try not to think about Mark Haynes getting out of the pool and not getting a towel. There we go. Two. Speedo. <laughs> <laughs> you put a hell of a pressure there. <laughs> two, uh, several years ago, some friends and I went out to West Texas. We went to Big Bend. And we did some some uh, some camping. We didn't shower for like three four days. And we got a hotel just nearby. We get there. We find out they're out of hot water, and we're just like super bummed. So we just go jump in the pool. It had Gross. it had been yeah. <laughs> hey, they were out of hot water. It's their fault. <laughs> they they weren't out of chlorine. They, chlorine. they were out of hot water. <laughs> Um, it had been, you know, daytime highs in the 90s, but the overnight was, you know, well below 60, right? Big wide swings of temperature out there. Might even be in the 40s. So we jump in that, we jump in that pool, and it is cold. And so the the uh, couple people climb out right away and got even colder because that air started to immediately evaporate on them. It was warm outside, but it was so dry that the evaporation started. I stayed in the water and warmed up, but once I got out, I was freezing cold too. So yeah, the evaporation effect is a real thing. So high humidity ratio limits both our high and low temperatures. It makes sense if our peak condition was here and we cool off at night, we can't really go below this point. Okay? Not possible. But, we're also limited if the if the design wet bulb for the area <clears throat> is between these blue lines, we can't get any further this way either. Does that make sense? If if the engineers have said this tower will work no matter what, we the conditions here must always be below these blue lines. So during the summer we're stuck. It's a very small range, right? We talk about maybe 20 degree difference between the, the overnight low and the daytime high. Where I grew up, it was easily 30 degrees in Chicago. We were down here a little bit. You go to Phoenix or the desert, right? You read stories, it's 110. And then at night, it's 32 frost forms in the desert. Low, temp, low humidity ratios, much wider operation. Big swings from dry bulb to wet, or from uh, lows to highs. The wetter it gets, the tighter we're constrained. Um, so this is a heat map of all the design conditions for Houston over uh, 365 days, actually over 8760 hours of a year. Okay, so where it is dark blue, it's less than 24 hours um, of oper of operation in that area, and then it magnifies up. So where's most of our operating hours? Very humid. Tucked right in here, in this 90, 80 percent relative humidity. A lot of those are the overnight hours, right? right. Where we pull in over here, where we warm up and we're a little bit over here. A lot of operation right down there, in high relative humidity. Everything on that line is probably fog. <laughs> the, the, on the inside instep of that shoe, the boot, whatever you want to call this, the, the 
a downhill slope um, mm -hmm. ski ramp, whatever you want to call this, if you're on that inside line, you're at 100% over the humidity. That's typically going to be at night. We're not going to be 100% after the sun comes up very long. So, the 80 degree uh, uh, wet bulb goes right through our, our peak wet bulb condition as defined by ASHRAE. Our peak dry bulb condition, just this side of the 95 degree, but way, way inside of 105. Why do you think engineers sometimes would design systems to be able to work at 105 degree dry bulb? Anyone? Because they're put in areas where you get 115 dry bulb. <laughs> <laughs> if, if the engineer was born, raised, and lived in Houston, why would he design for 115 or 105? I'm sorry. There's two reasons. One. Engineers typically don't get in trouble for providing too much air conditioning, though we'll talk about why it's a problem, especially in DX. And two, this is the temperature as measured in the air in free air space. Okay? You surround this with a bunch of concrete, you put it on a white roof, you put it enclosed in a bunch, uh, you know, in restricted air, you can get past this that's not the true air temperature. It's almost like you've stuck it in an oven. Right? You, the sun has baked that concrete. That concrete gets, that asphalt gets hotter than 95 degrees, right? Okay. So it's going to start radiating and warming the air potentially around that equipment. I had an engineer who, if they were going to pad mount ground something, put something on the ground with grass, you know, there was a reasonable amount of grass around it. They designed it at 95. They were putting it up on a roof that designed it at 105 to take into that, that effect. So we got convection and radiation that create a higher temperature. So even though the air, as measured as ASHRAE measures the air, <clears throat> is not hotter than 95 degrees almost ever here, you can have localized spots where it gets warmer because of an oven effect, heat island effect. Yeah, down too much equipment together effect. Or <laughs> Recirculation, Recirculation effect. effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay. How much higher would you would you think you would design? Let's say, Brett, if you were concrete pad mounted, but you don't have a lot of air restriction after you're going to get the radiation and the convection of the air, but it's also with like a, a DX uh -huh. uh, and, and fan induced. You, yes, you are still radiating, but you're going to have a mix because you're going to have your true dry bulb mixing with, where would you design to that? 95. 95. Maybe 98. <coughs> okay. Somewhere in that range. I, I'm just because talking about free air movement yep. in the same condition where you would design. Okay. Yep. Because we're in a much less humid condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, when we got way over here, then up over there, and okay, there's a lot less moisture in the air. So where I'm most worried about designing to a leaving air temperature of 52 or 54 degrees off of this wet bulb, mm -hmm. if I was 55 or 56 off this dry bulb because I didn't quite have my heat rejection, I'm not in disaster country because I'm a little bit lower on the moisture. Okay. And oversizing the X, as we'll get into, is way, way worse. Okay? You're talking about an air cooled chiller? Sure, I'll throw it at 105 all day long. Who cares if I have 20 extra tons of chiller? Right? Mm -hmm. But 20 extra tons or 20% extra capacity on DX equipment? Disaster. Sure. I was on a roof yesterday for that very reason. Our wet bulb really affects our cooling tower. We've got some areas right up there on that chart that shows it. There are going to be some times where the cooling tower is not going to make its set point because of that wet bulb. And it, and it happens occasionally when you basically put your cooling tower and try to size it perfectly for that 80 degree wet bulb scenario. And we have some areas around town that we have chillers that will surge in the heat of the day because their cooling tower can't meet that number. 
and that's because we didn't size the tower adequately. In Phoenix, they never have that problem. They may have a stacking in the condenser problem or something because of their cooling tower, but you could actually don't even need to use chillers in some cases in Phoenix because you can get free cooling from your tower. Your tower is so dry there that we can use water, which that's another problem, we'll talk about that. There's not enough water in Phoenix to keep everybody <coughs> wet because it's desert. So you gotta have a good water supply because they're gonna use millions of gallons of water to cool. Millions and millions of gallons of water are being vaporized through cooling towers and that's a, that's a huge expense. Uh, in a place that doesn't have, it's a desert, so it doesn't have lots of water. They have to go underground to get water. <clears throat> the, uh, we have a couple of sites here on the West Loop. I think we've got a site that we can't, we go into surge on this, on the centrifugal because of, we can't get the tower water below 84 degrees in some cases because of our dew point wet bulb scenario in certain times of the year. And it's only usually about a week, but then we can't size them all that way every time because now our cooling tower just, just changed its size. So I know not very many people work on centrifugals in here, but the, it, it has to do with that with that scenario, how much, how much can I cool with water? And then as opposed to that, we were just talking about, he just told you that uh, Phoenix, you could have a scenario where the water temperature, if you vaporize it, could get down to 32 to 40 degrees. So we have that dew point where it, here you've got freezing in the desert in the night and 115 during the day. Well, it's so dry there that it, it'll pick up that moisture. You can literally just take cooling tower water and they will put, use cooling tower water in a downstream coil in the building to cool the building with nothing but cooling tower. The cooling tower is doing the work of that huge centrifugal that they have that typically cools it. But because the tower can do it all by itself, there is no sense of running mechanical cooling if all you got to do is run a pump and a fat and a cooling tower <laughs> thing. Right, it's kind of like uh, uh, an advanced version of a swamp cooler, exactly. or evaporative cooler. It, it we is. We used to use in Phoenix at least in the 60s it, and 50s. I it is in the cooling there. tower application, but you're taking that water from the basin of the swamp cooler and using that basin water to cool the building. That way you're, it, and it'd be nice if you could put some of the moisture in the building because it's so dry, people have got nosebleed. Yeah. At 70 degrees inside, really. really. Bad chat so it'd be nice to have a swamp cooler <coughs> cooling the building because that's what they use in Phoenix for most of their cooling, is they use it what's called a swamp cooler. Yeah, they used yeah. to. I don't think so much anymore. I think they still do in some cases. If they're smart, they do if yeah. they have water. Well, <coughs> the, uh, yeah, if you go out to Phoenix, first time I went to Phoenix, I was like, why do all these houses have rooftops on them? Mm -hmm. That's where the evaporative cooler used to be. It's where the evaporative cooler used to be. They used to set the evaporative cooler on the roof, just advanced version of a swamp cooler, just <clears throat> dump water over the top and run air through it. Nice. The air was so dry, it evaporated, it cooled the air, and you blow it into the house, and it's nice and moist. Presto chinjo. Now, instead of trying to keep electricity uh, usage low now they're worried about water so most people have refitted to uh, you know standard mechanical cooling equipment but they use packaged rooftops because that's where it was it was, the, it was the weirdest thing when I the first time I went there I was yeah, like who puts a packaged rooftop on a house same thing in the Central Valley in California too you can they do it all over the all over that part of the second anywhere in the dry country they need a humidifier where we need just the air conditioner and dehumidification. They need to humidify their air. I've been around a long time, and I know a few of you might be, but used to, a lot of times they just boil water on the stove all day long just to keep their, the moisture level up in their house because they've got to make some moisture in there. It's, it actually makes it more comfortable just by throwing some moisture in the air. It's so dang dry. Okay. 55 degrees is the default supplier temperature for HVAC systems. If you're talking to anybody and they say, well, just make sure it's making 55 degrees air, why? Why do we use 55 degrees? The answer is find 55 degrees fully saturated on your site chart and heat that air sensibly up to 75 degrees. And I'm gonna In other words, get on the, get on the, on the slope. <coughs> 
at 100%. So that's on the inside of the, the instep of that chart and plotted at 55. 55 on the instep. And then move it to the right so you hit 75 and what your rotor humidity. In other words, hit the instep. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Right on the inside slope, right where you would be sliding at 55. And that's 100%. And then go directly to the right to 75. And where does that hit rotor humidity? 50. Perfect. That's why they use 55 degree discharge here. What's it called? This whole line right down there. That's 100%. That's on the right. That's 100% right. humidity. Right. So hit 55 on it and then go directly to the right, which is heating it. And all these numbers are heated. Mm -hmm. so go directly to the right and then hit 75. Or you find it you're right on the 50. You're on the 50% from the humidity line. Mm -hmm. You hit the road of humidity, it's 50%. Mm -hmm. Because you're mixing the air with indoor temperature. When it hits indoor and it's 75, it's 50% right of humidity. When you take in 100% outside air at 55 degrees. It's not really outside air, but it's when it leaves the coil, it's 55 degrees at 100% of humidity. Now that we did that, let's hit this number up here real quick. Just to show what it is this morning. Because in about an hour, I'm going to do it again. We're going to see what change, what the relative humidity changes to. When we got 48 dry boat, 42 wet boat. Let me let me finish this. Real oh yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I'm That's all right. Everybody, find it and warm it up to 75. What was the percent RH? 50. 50. God, doesn't that sound perfect? <clears throat> That's what that does. So what happens if instead of trying to maintain a 75 degree space? with 55 degree air. What happens if we try and use 55 degree air to maintain a space at 70 degrees? <coughs> you use that 55 degree air and you only warm it up to 70, which is what happens when it hits the room. What's the percent RH? <coughs> yeah, I do you think 75 at 50% or 70 at 60% is a more comfortable position? 75 at 50. Yeah, definitely 75 at 50. All day long. So how many customers do you have that say, God, we want to keep it 70 degrees in here because it's always so hot and humid? Maybe that's helping, but maybe if that equipment's designed to provide 55 degree air, How's that working for? It's not. It's making it worse. Let's do 80 real quick. <laughs> 55 to 80. What happens if you go 55 to 80? It's not dry enough. dry enough to be super comfortable but it's getting close right. that's the way I run my house but you get it colder than 55 off your coil I don't know I, I didn't look at I have to look at it I don't go that close <coughs> could be I'm low on refrigerant charge and it could be that I've got it <laughs> saturation temperature much lower so true true story I, my house was built in 1961 so it's got terrible insulation and a, and a terrible vapor barrier when I bought it, it had a four-ton unit that served the original house and a two-ton unit that served the 500-square-foot expansion. So right, two tons on 500 square feet. Wow. Made, made good it. sense. Perfect setup. Perfect setup. I had to run it at 68 to 70 degrees to try and keep me comfortable. And so my wife, Elizabeth, was always freezing cold, and it was always like 67% RH in there. Even if that too. Mm -hmm. So, 
I go, I call Charlie, and I buy one of our high-end variable speed XL 20 XLI, and I drop it to three tons, and I rezone part of my house to pick up the kitchen and my wife's office, put it on the two-ton unit. So it's got a little more space, run a three-ton unit. We keep our house at 75 and everybody's comfortable. And we sucked the moisture out of the house. We had a unit that was capable of removing moisture from the house consistently. And now I could raise the temperature, my utility bill went in half, and we're both comfortable. Cold, humid air can be hot to one person and cold to another. Moderate, dry, most people are comfortable. If you're sitting passively in 68, 70 degree moist room, you're gonna be cold. As soon as you start doing something, you're gonna be hot. It's wet. So we, we really wanna try and get our customers ready <laughs> for this condition. If they have a single speed piece of equipment, they may not be possible. We just may not run enough. Okay? But we want to try and get them to migrate to that condition. All right, let's plot 4842. And what do, we, what do we think of the highs today? 70? Uh, no, it's probably like 55 or 60. Oh, okay. 60? I was wishful thinking. Yes, you were. All right, 4842. Let's pick 60. The reason why I did that is here a little bit lighter. The temperature's going to go up. I'll take another temperature outside. We'll see what it changes to. Because that's just drive open wet bulb. Both of those numbers are going to change. The dew point won't because we haven't got a front. I don't think. I don't think we have one. Yeah. I think so. I've got my guesses. Hmm? Sorry, son. Film all right. I'm getting sixty. So you got forty. Oh, I'm sorry. So uh, this is when it gets to sixty. So take okay. this, come over to sixty, and come up. Let's see. A little shade under 40. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you warm to 60. Okay, when you warm to 60. Okay, I got Okay. You. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> I get lost in the line. Like, Whoa. There's a lot of lines. A lot of lines. Another reason I, I like the, the one I have is because I have the one in my set of iron. So, curious to me. Oh, I have a bigger one. No one, no both ones are doing now. No, I'm not supposed to have that one, but. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't I can we, see it. We didn't confiscate it from you. Uh, <laughs> Alright. Everybody tracked somewhere along this? No? Okay. This was our start condition, and just like we've done the the warming it up, this was when this air warms to the high today of 60, that's where I think it's going to end up. That's my projection. What are we, okay. you, so if you drew your horizontal line, you would end up exactly there. Okay. Let, let's, do a, let's do a correlation to warming that up by putting it in the building mm -hmm. to 75 degrees. What's that going to give you? What's it going to give the humidity in the building? Okay. What is the humidity at 48, 42? <coughs> uh, 60%? 60%. 60? Yeah. Okay. And then we put it in the building and warm it up to just go straight line right. <coughs> Did you hit 70 degrees Fahrenheit and then find out what is that color of humidity when I put it in the building? So this basic, I'm, I'm asking you what that economized air is going to give you well we're, 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 we're trying to say that 75 is a more desirable condition let's so let's that. use 75. Let's do 75. let's do 75 75 so we take one. this 48 42 and we warm it all the way to 75 because we just dropped it in the building we're we using that for our cooling building. So so can where we, do we end up or can we is that an economizer <coughs> number can we use that in houston <coughs> In fact, we talk all the time about we can't use outside air to cool a building in Houston. Now we're going to find out. So that's exactly what it is. It was 20 minutes ago, or now, whatever. I can't keep track of time. 45 minutes ago. So plot 48 dry bulb, 42 wet bulb, and then run that straight right on the on the on the chart to you hit 75. So about 27. About 27 percent range. That's where I am. So if you can't cool a building with that, I don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe 75 is too warm, right? We are in heating season. Maybe we should have stopped at 70. Maybe you should stop at 70. Right. But again, we can do some economizing in Houston based on that number. Just today, right now. Yeah, or what? Yeah, if the space is actually hot, they would be in a combine, and otherwise they'd be heating anyway. But so you don't need mechanical cooling when we have those temperatures. So it is possible. Everybody keeps arguing that point. I, I've argued that point too. We don't have very many days like this either. So, in all honesty, I mean, as a as a percent of our hours, we can go back and walk. How many days a week? Forty-eight degrees. Okay. Here's a rule of thumb. The outside air temperature is less than 55 degrees. You can't have a humidity problem in a comfort cooling application. Okay. If you do, something's wrong. What temperature? 50? 55. 55, okay, good. Because the, the air can't hold enough moisture for when it warms up to go into the 70, 75 degree space for there to be a humidity problem. If you've got 75% percent, seventy-five percent RH in a room and it's 55 degrees or less outside, where's the moisture source? What else is wrong? Okay. Got a couple of sweat hogs in a room. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you're saying it's okay to have about 27 or 30 degree uh, RH inside the building? That's not what we're necessarily saying, but we're okay. saying that you don't need mechanical cooling right. Because mechanical cooling will make it even worse. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. It'll be even worse. It in off the I'm saying, you have a perfect cooling situation at 48, 42. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
in Houston because it's going to warm up as people start moving around the building. The temperature is going to go up even more, and also the outdoor temperature is going to go up, mm -hmm. and the wet bulb is also going to change. And you'll see because I'm going to take another number here in a little while and see whether it's still usable. Because in reality, if we only get to 54, 55 degrees today, you might be able to economize the whole damn day. We're going to find that out. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not very, how many days do we get like this? Not very many. Because it was 70 two days ago. Okay. So when we start using mechanical cooling, I don't have a slide for this up here uh, until after I get past the question. Okay. Pick any condition out here and we start running it across the cooling coil. Okay. We cool it down until we hit saturation and we follow, start following it down the saturation curve. Okay. On the train um, uh, psych charts, they actually have what are called cooling coil lines. Okay, the little, little cheater lines that more accurately represent what happens. So if you see these black horizontal lines that start out, uh, the highest one's around 130 uh, grains per pound. There's one at 110, there's one at 92, okay? Mm -hmm. Wherever you start, if you basically try to stay between them as you start coming down and cooling, okay? That is mimicking what the air will do going across that cooling coil. Okay. So if you start hot, hot and moist, and come over and you start cooling down to 55, okay, you'll end up down there. Okay, following those cooling coil lines. So this isn't perfect, but here's a laser. A little red button. So, you, so I can do that. Okay. If you want to, want to stand in front of the light. Okay. So what is the warmest air that you can use to maintain a space at 70 degrees, 50% RH, okay? So, to help with that, find 70 degrees at 50% RH and track it back to your cooling coil lines. So this is the application where you've got a customer who is adamant that they want it to be 70 degrees in the space, but they want it to be comfortable. Because they want it to be 50% RH. How cold does their discharge air need to be to do that? That's what we're finding out right now. 48. Okay. While you're at it, do it. If the customer wanted it to be 60 degrees and 50% RH. So find your 60 degree point. Go to 50% and track it back to your cooling coil lines. Johnny doesn't even need the psych chart. He knows this off the top of his head. I was actually just remembering back to the client. We used to have the libraries and archives. Bang, bang, 68 degrees. Of Couldn't even get it. stay there. You were telling me about that. I'm well on the short. Smithsonian is. Which one's that? I wonder what it is for the. We, we'll, we'll get to archival applications and stuff like that. Like the Constitution. What, are they, what kind of the kids have? Uh, what, uh, what's anybody got? How about this one? 54. 54? Okay. How about this one? 42. Okay. 
I had 50 and 40 on, on mine, but again, fat marker. Okay. So I started at 70, 50%, and I backtracked to 50, give or take. Started at 60 or 50%, and I backtracked to 40, give or take. Anybody got an application that requires 60% at, I'm sorry, 60 degrees at 50% RH? Seem like an insane condition. Active How about room. just about every operating room in the city wants to operate there? Operating rooms, and some of them want 100% outside air. They're crazy and wrong. But they do it. Remember when they want it, doesn't mean they get it. Can you repeat the temperature and the humidity? 60 degrees at 50% RH. That's what they want in operating rooms in Houston. Oh. So it used to be about 70 degrees at 50% RH. Okay? And the reason for the relative humidity to be 50 has to do with growth of microbials. It is the lowest point for all types of microbial growth. If you get below 40 or 30, one type of microbial starts growing. If you get above 60, another type of microbial starts growing. So you aim for the middle, it's the lowest of all, is at 50% RH. So they used to design operating rooms for 70 degrees. But as we got better at infection control and those kinds of things, the uh, surgeons needed to wear more and more and more equipment, more gowns, all that kind of stuff. They're covered up, they're in basically moon suits and for some types of surgeries. So they need it colder so that they're not perspiring. And not only that, they don't want their mask and their goggles and everything to fog up. Because it's gonna fog up if we've got a dew point that's gonna hit that when they're breathing inside that and they can't see what they're doing. So if you originally had an operating room that was designed for 70, and you start trying to make it 60, you better be changing your discharge air conditioning. Okay? Or you're gonna end up at 65% RH, and you're starting to get into microbial growth on the high end, okay? And you're risking infections. Infection control is a huge, huge deal. Most, most operating rooms aim for about 65 in the city, but the, the orthopedics, the guys who are you know, doing a joint replacement and they're hammering a ball socket into somebody's bone, that guy takes a lot of work. He's working hard. He wants a cooler. Another fun thing starts happening if you had a room that was originally designed to be 70%, or 70 degrees, I'm sorry and you want to make it 60. I've even heard of 58 and 55 being targeted for some of these advanced surgeries that they're doing today. Okay. What starts to happen to your vapor barrier in that space? Remember those windows that fogged up because the, how air, cold the air was inside the store versus the dew point outside? Well, if the, if the air outside the OR, none of them should use DX equipment. Some of them do. That's why Brett's here. He's telling you what can and can't have. We've actually but, tried to do it a couple of times uh, where we did mechanical. It didn't work. So. Sure. Um, I mean, there's there's ways to basically build the OR as a refrigerator box. The question is, did they? Or did they design it as an originally just a space that now they're trying to make a refrigerator? Um, hit close to home. Um, so my mom just had a surgery a few months ago on her hip. She fell at work, tore um, basically the hip version of your ACL. Yeah. Workman's comp, long story, buy me a beer. It's not that exciting. She, she has the surgery at an outpatient surgery center. I was less than thrilled about this. Okay. Long time ago, she also tore some muscles in a rotator cuff. So she was interested in having that operated on as well after she healed from her fall. 
um, the surgeon told her that she basically waited too long. Those two muscles won't won't work anymore. They've atrophied. So um, if she would have to do a shoulder replacement, and it's an inverse shoulder replacement, again, long story, find me a beer. Um, I told her, I looked at her in the eye and said, you are not allowed to have that surgery at an outpatient surgery center. Because that is an orthopedic surgery. The surgeon's gonna be hammering on her bone and he's gonna want it cold. And if it's a DX piece of equipment that wasn't designed to have a 60 degree space, we're talking about having 65% RH in that space. Not my mom. So. Okay. Note, what we just found was how cold the air needed to be cooled to reach the right dew point humidity ratio, not necessarily how cold the supplier needed to be delivered to the space. Okay. 842, usually in Houston, 9595. Wait, that's not right. <laughs> okay, it's going to be hot. This is going to move all over the place. This is going to be relatively constant, right? We're always roughly trying to maintain the same conditions. In the winter, maybe a little, not quite as warm, but it's not a wide operating range. Okay, the wide operating range we ask for equipment to go through is because of this. So, when we're looking at mixed air, we just plot the two points, okay, that we've got. So today, obviously, point B would be over here. Right? Well, let's pretend it's summer because it is 10 months a year. Okay, and we find 95 degrees at, I don't know, that looks like 77. Okay, plot that real quick on your, on your chart. 95 at 77, we'll pick. And plot 80 at 50%. 95 at 77 wet bulb, 80 at 50% our range. mix them. We're going to mix them in an equal ratio of 50-50. 50% outside air, 50% return air. Anybody want to take a guess what that condition is going to be? In the middle? In the middle. <laughs> Hell yes. Okay. It is simply a ratio. So if it was 25, 75, 25% outside air, 75% return air, we would end up a quarter of the way there. If we flipped it, we'd end up a quarter of a way this way. So the difference between 80 and 95 is 15. So you just multiply that by whatever your split ratio is. 50-50 is seven and a half. So your mixed air condition is gonna be seven and a half and on the line. So 87 and a half and whatever that comes out to be. And if it's 75%, seven and a half cut in half is 3.75, so it's going to be 83.75 on the line. Okay. The only tricky thing to remember is that whichever side has more, you're closer to. So if you're thinking by 0.75, don't end up over here. Right? It's a weighted balance. Whichever area you have more of, you should be closer to that side. Easy check. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. 
Okay, let's run over that one more time. Yeah. I think I missed something. Okay, so we're, we're, we're going to come up with something half between the two. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Where do we go from there? Are okay. we good with that number? Is that it? That's it. That's if it's 50-50, okay. that's it. Okay. If it's 75-25, okay, that's it. Okay. If it's 75 out of four? 25, 75, that's it. Okay, I missed something. There. Okay, thank you. But it's always going to be on the line. So the 20 is for 20% is going to be close to the 80, and the 80 is going to be close to the 95. Okay. okay. The same works if, for some weird reason, this point was above this, okay, and you were mixing the same temperature, drier air with more moist air. You just use the humidity ratio. Don't use dew point. Use the humidity ratio. Okay, the, the dew point is not a linear scale. Use the humidity ratio and find the halfway point or what, whatever percentage point, and that's how that's going to mix. Okay? It's a weird application. I don't know when it would happen, but it works. Okay, dry bulb's easier. Like today. All right. So here's the application. We've got a unit making 4,000 CFM, 3,000 of it's return, 1,000 of it is outside air. Our ratio is 25%. <coughs> so our mixture is 83.75. Okay, it's just another way of doing the math. What they do here, take your 95 since it's 25%, multiply it by 0.25, 80 times 0.75, you get this, add them together, that's your mixed air condition. I like thinking of it as a ratio between the two, but this works just as well whatever you're more comfortable with. And again, since we're typically dealing in rough calculations in the field, what's it roughly doing? You measure your return condition, you measure your outside air condition, you know roughly it's 25%. Where's 25% on that line? It's right there. Uh, another quick thing to bring up, why is the return air 80 degrees? Other than Mark Haynes' house, who keeps their space 80 degrees? No one? So why, is, why are we using this as an example point? It's like ARI. Because most returns we deal with are plenum returns. Plenums are warmer than the space. Okay, they're gonna pick up heat load that air is going to pick up heat load as it moves back. So it may have been 70 degrees in the space, but it gets into that plenum and starts warming up by the time it makes it back to the unit, 80 degrees. There's also a difference there in Houston. In reality, because of our long cooling season, we really need the, we need all your filters and returns at the ceiling are as close to it as we can possibly get it because that's where the warmest air is. A lot of the earlier models that were built back in the 60s were actually at the floor. So you're picking up floor temperature. Floor temperature is colder, so you're not getting the delta T that you require in order to do adequate dehumidification. Now you've got stratified air. Mm -hmm. The stratified air has more at <coughs> the ceiling. In fact, you may even find a situation where you may have so much moisture at the ceiling, if you've got a high ceiling, that you will condense at your registers, right. and then you get a little bit of raindrops occasionally. Mm -hmm. yep. so when I changed my unit, I moved my return to my ceiling. I gained a closet. At 83 um, degrees, mm -hmm. we need 65 degrees to cool the space. Effectively. Um, no. Um, so, I don't know how you look at that. Let me see what you're doing. I'm just, just on the eye eye line. Line. We came with cross so it's like 65. Got it. So. Those are just room air conditions. Yeah. So, this air warmed up, okay, when it came through. So, 
you're right, it's over here. If you follow that down, you feel like you're at 63. We're about to talk about sensible heat ratio. Okay, that's actually a perfect leading question. Well done. I'll buy you lunch. Like 57 degree um, coil or so, leaving the coil. But we've been going for an hour and a half, and I need a break, and I'm guessing you do too. So let's let's be back in heat ratio. Okay, so I wanted to come back and show that we're talking about the warmest air that could be used and why that doesn't necessarily work. Okay, so the question that was asked was does this mean that we could use 60 ish, 63, whatever you want to call this, degree air to meet this condition? Okay. And on the psych chart, what we've learned so far, yes. In application, no. Okay. I'll show you why. Sensible heat ratio. When we're doing anything sensibly, okay, it doesn't mean we're doing it smartly. It moves, means we're moving it left or right and not up and down. Okay. This has to do with the sensible heat content of air. And this has to do with the latent heat content of air. Okay. To put it another way, you take your stove, you get a... a Stock pot, you fill it up with water, you put it on the stove, and you start heating it. You are sensibly heating it. Okay? You're heating it from the 70 degree tap water up to 212 degrees. That was sensible heating. As soon as it starts boiling, it's going to maintain 70 degrees, I'm sorry, 212 degrees, and it's going to start boiling and turning into steam. Okay? That is latent heating. The amount of energy it takes to heat something sensibly is significantly less than the amount of heat it takes to vaporize it, to, to go through latent, okay? We're breaking bonds, okay, on a, on a chemical level, as opposed to just warming it up or cooling it down, okay? So there's a lot of energy it takes to change the state of something versus just to change its temperature. So that's what we mean by sensible. So when we sensibly cool <coughs> something, going this way, when we start removing moisture, we're dehumidifying, we're doing the latent heat, con the latent content. So if we're going down and to the left, sensible and latent. The, the heat content of a space that we need to cool is a mix, in most cases, of sensible and latent. We are all sitting here, we're generating heat by sitting here. Something on the order of 450 BTUs per person. Okay. Our computers, generating heat. These lights, generating heat. But we're also perspiring a little bit, okay? Just natural order of business. We're trying to maintain 98.6 degrees, at least that's the number we all learned. Apparently it's actually changed, but we're, we're trying to maintain that, okay? Our body's perspiring a little bit. That's vaporizing and going into the air. So we need to remove that moisture as well. Oh, it was Perry. <laughs> What's up? No, I'm not on site right now. I'm at some class. Uh, What's up? Carry ticket outside, please. Total heat gained is sensible plus latent. The sensible heat gained over that, we end up with a percentage. Okay. If we had no latent heat that needed to be done in the space, the sensible heat ratio would be one. Okay, a great example of a sensible heat ratio of one is an electrical room, or an IDF room, or a data center. Okay. You just have some electrical equipment venting to the space 
and needing to be cooled. And there's no moisture being used there. Okay. So in most applications, we have a sensible heat ratio of less than one, which means we have some latent heat we need to do. So when we did this, we assumed a sensible heat ratio of one. Uh, hey, look, that's what I just said. Uh, this will be the case, so we need to provide air with a lower target dew point in order to meet our actual rel percent relative humidity. Okay. So on your site chart, that circle in the middle is not actually an ideal condition for anything. It's called the index point. Around the sides, um, specifically the top and right side, you'll see some uh, green numbers with one kind of at uh, due east up through 0.2 at close to due north. Everybody see those around the, around the outside perimeter? So if you index, that is take a straight edge and run it through that index point, to those various conditions, those are your sensible heat ratio, so you could draw a line on the site chart, okay? So a sensible heat ratio of one index is perfectly horizontal with the point, and a sensible heat ratio of 0.2 is a whole lot of moisture, okay, a whole lot of moisture change. That makes sense to everyone? A pretty standard sensible heat ratio for most applications is 0.8. Okay. Another way to say that is 80% of the load in the space is sensible, 20% is latent. So when we, when we, if we're trying to hit this point, okay, we need to cool to here so that the room warms it along this line and not a perfectly horizontal line. Okay, make sense? So when, we, when that question was asked, can we just cool it to 60 and that be okay? If it was a hundred, if it was a sensible heat ratio of one, the answer is yes. Since most of our applications are not, the answer is no. We have to go a little bit colder than what we thought. So to think about that for a minute, that 40 degree supplier to hit that 60 at 50% actually has to be colder than that. It's because we have a lo latent load. We have a latent load. Without a latent load, it's one. It's one. <clears throat> okay. And what are those conditions? What? There would be some room that just has a bunch of electrical stuff in it. It's producing heat. Not humans. Not humans. Humans. Not humans. Okay. Nobody's going to ask you to go figure out what the sensible heat ratio of the space that you're trying to serve is. Okay. But it is helpful for you to use your eyes when you're diagnosing a problem. Okay? Is there a is it a commercial kitchen where they're boiling water to make pasta? Is there a coffee maker that there's moisture coming out of? Is it a densely packed space? Is it a gym? We sweat a lot more when we're exercising than we do sitting at a desk. Is there a water feature? Is there an indoor fountain? Is there a pool? Those are things that add a lot of moisture to the air, and we need to know about them. Okay. So if you're diagnosing a problem, just keep track of what's in that space. <coughs> one, one more second, Johnny, and then I'll grab you. We're making sensible heat ratios lower, not higher. Okay. We, had All an we had an application in North Houston where they had a, a, a common room, four year area entering the building where they had a glass wall with water running down it continuously. It was like a fountain, sort of a fountain scenario, a waterfall scenario, and it was impossible to keep that, that space correct. Right, the sensible heat ratio of that room is gonna be way off from what it normally is, okay? That's an application where you might see, I don't know, probably not, but a point two, right? We've got to do a whole lot of, of uh, like removal <clears throat> compared to cooling. Okay, so 
Modern construction is making sensible heat ratios. I'll use the term worse. It's really, you know, it's much easier to cool 100% sensible than it is, you know, a mix. What are we doing for lights today? LED. LEDs. Okay. You take out a 100 watt fluorescent, you put in a 40 watt LED. That's 60 watts less of heat to the space. Heat to the system. Okay. Most of that heat gets picked up in the return air, but some of it goes to the space. 3.41 BTUs per what? We're putting more insulation in our walls. My 1961 house, not well insulated. Somebody's modern construction, pretty well insulated. You have high ceilings? We're making it worse. We're making it harder to condition. 55 degrees does not work for most applications now, even if you want to keep 75 to 50%. Okay? Because we've reduced the sensible load coming in. We're using white roofs, we're using green roofs. Okay? Anybody work on a building where there's plants growing on the roof? And I don't mean weeds, like growing out of my gutters. I mean like somebody intentionally planted plants? Yeah. Those absorb a whole lot of sensible heat, keep it from getting to the space. Great for energy usage, a pain in your behinds. Okay. So we already kind of did a little bit of this with coil curves. So if you got a sensible heat ratio, oh, okay. So we're gonna talk about how we Calculate the amount of area we need. That's really all I wanted to cover on sensible heat ratio. Okay? Like I said, nobody's going to ask you to go out and calculate it. Just use your eyes. Take a count. Is it an old asphalt roof? Is it a white roof? Are there LED lights? Are there fluorescent lights? You don't know? Ask your guy. Hey, have you guys done a lighting retrofit? If they haven't, also, we do lighting retrofits. I want to give you an application real quick. We had a, a place that they couldn't cool the building. It was a... Um, Chipotle, uh, a Chipotle, meaning it's just a business that they they make uh, burritos. Well, every table had its own light. So if you've been into a Chipotle, you'll see there's a little light over every table. It just so happened that they put heat lamps in every one of those instead of light lamps. <clears throat> so I went in and I and they had a cat they had 15 ton, 20 tons air conditioning. A little, not a very big room. Like from there to that wall is all it was. <clears throat> so I looked at the lights. I calculated just the just the wattage of those lights because they're each one of them were 120 watts. And then I calculated all that up in BTUs, and they were using half of their air conditioning load just in just in lights over the tables. And I said if you put the proper light in there for lighting, you'll get your air conditioning back. And they did, and I didn't have to go back. So just lighting alone can wipe you out there on that. So yeah, particularly retail space at Nordstrom's, I think, have their cooling is just for their lighting. Mm -hmm. They they think about it as <coughs> lights are a way they sell things. Mm -hmm. that, that, that expensive handbag looks better under this type of light than this type of light. <laughs> I don't care what the heat content of it is. Can they sell a bag at three hundred percent profit? That's what they care about. Almost everyone in this room has been to the watcher or know of knows about the watcher. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Lord. The watcher is the hibachi grill. Yeah. What's going on in there? Well, well they have they have steam coming out of the kitchen into the yeah. main dining room. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can actually see it's a cloud coming in. Yeah. Out there. You said they were closing, right? They are. Okay. So we don't have to worry about you watching. <laughs> yeah, they can't make it to me. This is, is what, what vaccination is applicable to what we do. You know, water. <laughs> so we do lighting retrofits too? Our, our energy team does, yes. yes. Anyway, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but, yeah, you're fine. Okay, so when we're determining what the airflow of the space is, we need to understand what sensible heat ratio is. Okay. 
check why he made the slide. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to plot this, we're just going to talk through it. Okay. There's a situation where we're trying to maintain 75 at 50%. Outside air is 75, 78, and we're going to bring in 80, 850 CFM of outside air. Okay, we plot that. 95, 78, yeah. Okay. The equation for determining how much air should go in a room is the sensible load, so the sensible heat, equals 1.085 times CFM times delta T, where delta T is the difference between space temp and supply temp, which is unfortunately both ST. Space and supply, SP and SU, okay? So if we rearrange that, and we know what the sensible load is because we calculated how many people are in the room at 450 BTUs per person, how many lights at whatever wattage, however many coffee makers and computers, we know this, and we just rearrange and solve for CFM. Okay. That's how an engineer figures out how much <coughs> air we need to put into a space. Okay. What that means, is that a supply air temperature, the supply dry bulb at this point, is assumed. <coughs> they make a guess and then iterate on it. Okay? <coughs> they start by making a guess on what the supply air temperature needs to be. So in this case, 80,000 BTUs, do the math, come out. We're going to put that much air into the space. We've gone through mixing. So this is what psychometrically, what the mixing and cooling condition would look like. So they made an assumption, a spire temperature of 54.8, mix condition, cool off, sensible heat ratio comes on. So the other way they do it is if they're trying to, they know they're trying to maintain this and they have an idea what the sensible heat ratio is going to be, they back into the supplier temperature. Back into the supplier temperature and then solve for CFM. It's good to know that right there. So the question is, did the engineer really do the sensible heat ratio and decide that 54.8 degrees was really the right air temperature? Or did they just go 55? Air conditioning is 55 degrees. Okay, both happen. Sometimes building automation will reset your supply air temp control point, and that can screw you too. So kind of keep an eye on what, if, if you go in there and you see this weird supply air temp reset, because they're trying to save money, it goes back into saving money. You drop that or you raise that temperature and you go to 57 or 60, you might find out that the room's not gonna make it because our supply air temp is too high in order to create the proper mixed air temp. So what the supply air temperature is, is very, very important. Enthalpy, okay, is along the top left, okay, that's just the measure of what the total heat content of air is, whether it's sensible or latent heat con content of air. Okay, so whether we get more humid or we get hotter, sorry, more humid or hotter, our, our enthalpy is gonna go up. As we get cooler and drier, it goes down. So when you're determining how, much, how many tons of refrigeration a space needs, you find what the mixed air condition entering the coil is, what your leaving air condition needs to be, you find the enthalpies and you find the delta between them, okay? The equation looks very, very similar, where total 
capacity is 4.5 times CFM times the change in enthalpy. The 1.085 we used in Sensible and the 4.5, that has to do with a whole bunch of constants that have to do with the fact that we operate at sea level, the, the um, heat content, the amount of energy it takes to move uh, the temperature of air, the amount of, uh, what it takes to move the uh, remove latent from air. I think 1.08 it, it boils down to 1.08 is just sensible for the most part. Yeah, 1.08 is total. It's total. That's correct. You say that's the difference. What the delta? The delta H is the mm -hmm. difference between our entering coil condition okay, and, leaving, and, leaving. and our leaving coil condition okay. along the end. Twenty-two to thirty-one. Pretty important here. So, if we think about this for a second, we have a unit, let's pretend it's a five ton unit, okay, that was designed for these conditions. What day was it designed for? What is that? 95. 95, 95 at 78. So, it's a hot, fairly humid day, right? If we start moving this line down to here, and we redo the mixed air, what's going to happen to point C? It's going to go down. It's going to drop. It's going to start moving this way, too. So if we get down over here, and now we come over, our delta is less. Right? right? If our delta is less, how many tons do we need on that five ton unit? Four? Maybe. Maybe even lower. Three and a half? So if it's a single speed five ton unit, what starts happening? Yeah. Starts cycling, right? It's going to cycle off. You're not going to get any dehumidification. It'll cool it too quick. It'll cool it too quick. Mm -hmm. right? Now, in reality, it's going to start pushing this point down too, right? Because that single speed five ton unit only knows how to be a five ton unit. Mm -hmm. Except for if the ambient air is 85 instead of 95, now it's a five and a half ton unit. So it's going to start pushing down here. There's no source of reheat on your unit. You're trying to maintain a space. Now you're leaving air temperatures colder. How much more quickly does that space hit set point? Really fast. It just compounds on itself. When we design a unit for this, and we start putting it anywhere else, it's not the perfect unit anymore. That's why we're going to variable speed compressors and things now, so. It's not the perfect unit anymore. So if you were calculating the load of this, 4.5 times the calculated CFM that you did using the 1.085 equation, delta enthalpy you should be to use. So in this case, this, this unit wants to be 12.7 tons on a full load day. Okay, that's the size. So you'd put a 12 and a half ton unit on there. 65 and raining outside. You need six. You need six, maybe less. That's where our problems start. Okay, I never, ever, ever use this equation. I don't even have it memorized. The other two, you can wake me up at three in the morning and I can tell you. Because what's total enthalpy? Sensible plus latent. Plus latent. So what's latent enthalpy? Total minus sensible. So I memorized 4.5 and 1.085 equations, and I just subtract into this. 
We're actually rougher than that. We just use 1.08. We don't even throw the five of them. <laughs> you were right. Look at that. One pound of 7,000 grains. Yay. Yay. Barley. <clears throat> it's all barley. <laughs> all right. <sighs> Constant volume systems. The vast majority of what you see on small package equipment. Some medium sized package equipment. And probably still a little large package equipment. Is that fair? Yep. It sucks. Okay. So you design for the full load condition. Calculate capacity. 52 degree here and there. Okay. Found the sensible heat ratio. That space is going to be 0.8, but when it's not really hot and sunny outside, the sensible heat ratio drops to 0.7. Right? There's not as much heat trying to come in through the walls, through the ceiling, all that. So your sensible heat ratio dropped. And on top of that, total capacity dropped. Difference in the sensible heat ratio lines. So if you did the 1.085 equation, 3650, on the part load, it says the supplier dry bulb should be 63 degrees. And we're going to cool it from there to there. Anybody in that space going to be happy? No. By the way, when we talk about what this discharge air temperature is, the discharge air in this exact condition is probably never exactly 63, right? It's some combination ratio of 49 and 75 as that compressor cycles. So it's 49 for a little while, then it's 75, and then it's 49, and then it's 75. Right? And the average of that is 63. And so the average of that is that we're maintaining a space at 75 degrees and 65% RH. Not good. Who's taking care of a unit that's had that problem? Everybody in the room. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what do you tell a guy who says, I've got footprint problems on a roof? How he's at West Park. He says, I want constant volume at 200 CFM all the time. And I don't, I don't know how many units he's got. I just told him to call modifications. I was not going to answer a question like that at 200 CFM constant. Uh, 200 CFM a ton, or just a blanket 200 CFM? A blanket 200 CFM because of. Uh, whatever I don't know the total volume of where he was but he had a really small space and I said we'll stage your cooling he goes no it's 100% cooling I said I not even looking at I was driving I, said, I, I don't think that's smart uh, he, I said I, I would think if you're gonna maintain a constant CFM across then you, you're gonna have to stage your cooling either through a variable speed compressor or what other means, I don't know how many units they have or, or, or what they're going to do, but it seems highly Suspect. unorthodox. I'm just trying to talk very nicely because they're within our organization. <laughs> um, so we, we, can, we can try and talk through that offline, not that it wouldn't be benefit, but I don't want to get too far off. But you could with a good enough control system rack up so let's say for a second we decided that each of these grills needed to be 200 cfm and for whatever reason they couldn't have a 1200 cfm unit on the roof they needed six 200 cfm units on the roof okay mm -hmm. with a good enough control system you'd start this one and you run it and you wait 
And if it doesn't make set point after a while, then we start that one. We run that for a little while. And if it doesn't make set point, then we start that one, okay. right? And then when we overshoot, we drop one, mm -hmm. okay? It's almost like how you would, how a CGAM would control its compressors to maintain discharge water temperature, okay? We'd almost treat them as individual stages. But, you know, if he's just trying to cool one room with 200 CFM, I mean, it depends on the application if that's even kind of going to work. Okay? So, I almost took out this chilled water control valve. Okay? Everything in this was really written around chilled water. But we're talking DX primarily because that's where we have the problems. And that's what you guys face every day. Okay? On this unit, this unit can maintain a constant 63 degree leaving, just like we saw in that last slide when I said we're going to modulate between the two. Okay. This guy could maintain exactly 63 degrees. And so we call it a constant quantity variable temperature. Okay. That's how that unit would control as a chilled water unit. Our DX equipment is going to control as a constant quantity of varying supplier temperature. It's going to be 49 for a little while. It's going to be 75 for a little while. And the balance of that is 63. Okay. Does that make sense? Constant volume with reheat. This is how everything worked for a long, long time. And it worked well. And the only thing that is wrong with it is that it's an energy hog. Because we're going to use full compressor here. We're going to cool the bejesus out of the air. We're going to maintain that 49 degree leaving. And then we're going to use this guy to keep the space comfortable. Thermostat has nothing to do with the operation of this cooling coil except for to say, be on. There's still some buildings around with this. Most of them are <coughs> chilled water. There's a whole lot of units around, uh, buildings around with this on DX, but with a different type of reheat coil that we'll get to in a little bit. But on a chilled water system, you'd run chilled water to the coil, you'd run hot water to the reheat, presto change out, everybody's really, really comfortable. Um, their energy bills suck. And so what we do is we come in and we refit the chiller to be a heat recovery chiller, and we actually make use of the condenser water on the heating side. We've even done that to air cool chillers. We've actually got a couple of heat recovery that we're actually using the, the discharge gas to heat water to to put in there for reheat or for, for any other thing for that matter. Because reheat works like a champ. You just you want to get the heat for free from somewhere. Okay. So that terrible 63 degree wet uh, supplier condition that we were talking about earlier. Super uncomfortable in the space, but if instead I don't know where it went, but if instead we got to cool all the way down, oh, I'm sorry, it's right here. We got to cool all the way down here and reheat back to 63. We got down to the dew point that we wanted, and then we reheated so that the air going to the space doesn't overcool the space too rapidly. Basically, all we're doing is slowing down the rate at which the room overcools. Make sense? Okay. It's a great way to think about reheat. You're just reducing the rate at which the space overcools. Okay, which allows you to get compressor runtime, pull moisture out of the air. When I went to school, my teacher told me back in the 75, 1975, he says, Air conditioning is taking a heat, taking heat from a place you don't want it and moving it to a place that doesn't matter. We just changed it now to taking heat from a place that we don't want it and putting it where we want it. It's not entirely true. We're taking some of it and putting it where we want it, but not all of it. Well, <laughs> uh, again, <laughs> you're correct. <clears throat> but we could, unless we want to use water cool condenser and use all of the condenser water to heat something. But if we're just going to take the discharge superheat and use that, basically we're talking about that summer. 
But in reality, now we're trying to use all that energy and try to put it back to use again instead of just dumping it outside. Or we don't waste it. So we're, we're trying to be less wasteful. But it's making it more complicated. So because of him, so we're getting more complicated now because the engineers, they all want to do something crazy with this heat, move it around from here to there. And then something breaks down and we can't figure out where the problem is. So it could be the reheat that's creating the problem on the system. Or like it is, well, let's take a, a KCC unit. You watch it. You watch it. <coughs> and, uh, and it becomes more complicated because we get one little complication. One sensor fails and it's probably on the reheat or maybe not on the reheat or discharge your temperature is wrong. And next thing, the whole machine has two or three things are wrong and then we got to figure out all those problems. So we need to understand this in order to fix that out. And that's why you're here. Right. So we appreciate you coming in. And in fact, this guy actually said when I asked him to do this, he said, man, I'd love to do this because I'd like to be able to have accurate numbers from you people. And, and, and yeah, it's totally true that you people out there, that happened. People, <laughs> you and, uh, like, uh, like, like we get from BAS all the time. It's your problem, it's a mechanical problem. And we go back, no, it's a BAS problem. Well, he has the same problem when we don't give him good numbers. And, and when he has numbers from whoever designs the system and those numbers are wrong because it's not the right application, then we end up with the wrong unit. And that's where we are in all these systems. So you need to help us understand this so that we can figure out what needs to be done next to fix the problems. So thank you. Again, I, you can't beat the source here. This is an amazing guy to teach this. So please listen. So part of why KCC units and all 100% outside air DX equipment is such a pain in the ass right? because of what we're asking it to do. Standard DX equipment, Voyager precedent, we ask it to be somewhere around here, mm -hmm. right? There's a return air temperature, relatively constant. There's outside air changes, but we're only asking it to do 10, 15, 20% outside air. So it, it can't get much outside of this. What if you're doing 100% outside here? What are all the different places this point can be? And we gotta make sure that we have the right amount of superheat, the right amount of dehumidification, the right leaving air temperature, the right oil return, the right, the right, the right, the right, the right. Yeah, it gets complicated in a hurry. Good water. <laughs> <laughs> if if only everybody would put in chill water. We can fix a lot with that. So this is just another way of looking at what we were just talking about. It's a slightly different application um, or a slightly different set of numbers. But we've got this 65 degree leaving air temperature to balance this heat equation at part load. And so I ask, why is it always so cold in restaurants? First time I, or one of the times I taught VAB systems, I added this slide in because I had just gone to a um, pizza and craft beer place in the Heights. Okay, this was ten years ago, and there was an hour-long wait to sit inside or immediate seating outside. There's few things in the world I like better than craft beer and pizza. I remember that. Okay. So, like sweet. Really excited to eat at this place. We sit down outside, and it's like 80 and muggy. You know what I got? Ice water and a salad. I didn't want anything to do with pizza. I didn't even want anything to do with craft beer because craft beer isn't super cold. I wanted ice water. So why do restaurants make it cold? Because if it's hot and muggy, you don't order the right stuff. Kind of like lighting in the store. Exactly. You got, a, you got a, an extreme temperature, an extreme lighting. Okay. So when it gets to be part load condition, you guys run down the temperature. Make sure you're ordering hot entrees. And so instead of maintaining 
a 75 degree space, they maintain a 65 degree space so that that leaving air temperature is down below 55. They don't know they're doing it, but they're doing it. Variable volume systems help a lot. Okay? If instead of varying the supplier temperature or the mean supplier temperature, average supplier temperature to the space, if we vary the airflow, we get to maintain a relatively constant supplier temperature to the space and vary the load. Now in this 1840 CFM application, when it goes to part load, we just slow it down, but we keep providing the delta we need, whether this delta is 20 degrees or 30 degrees, whatever we need for that application. We slow down the air <coughs> instead of reducing the compressor. restate that. The compressor reduces as well, but the leaving air temperature stays the same. Okay. Got to have multiple stage, varying, something like that. Clarify that. <coughs> um, so this is just another way of looking at it, calculating the um, part load airflow while maintaining full delta T. Okay. Single zone VAV. So one of the problems with VAV is you need VAV boxes. Well, who's going to put VAV boxes on a five-ton unit? No one. Who's going to put them on a 15-ton unit? Not very many people. But if you have a big open application, gym, open office, cafeteria, church sanctuary, something like that, okay, really only works in big open areas. The more walls you put in the way, the less it's going to work. We can use something called single zone VAV. <laughs> Every train unit down to three tons can come from the factory with single zone VAV control. We need to be able to vary the speed of the supply fan. We are going to vary the speed of the supply fan to maintain the space temperature. So on a traditional thermostat, Contact closes, cooling, compressor starts. Okay. Can't use a traditional thermostat with this. We need a zone sensor talking to a Reliatel or a Telpac controller. And it's going to say what the space temperature is. And it's going to use an algorithm to control supply fan speed to maintain target space temperature. The cooling is going to stage to maintain a discharge air temperature. So there's a factory discharge air temperature after the coil. We're going to stage compressors to maintain it. Okay. Obviously, there's a problem. If you do this on a five ton single speed unit, what are your choices for varying the cooling capacity? Not a heck of a lot. Okay. But it will still work better. It will still work better than a constant volume machine. Why? Capacity is about the same, but you're on the right track. Okay. Five tons of cooling at half airflow is the same five tons at full airflow, but what happens to the delta T? It gets bigger. It, gets bigger. it doubles, right? If we half the airflow, the delta T doubles. <coughs> okay. So we're going to provide less really cold air to the space than more kind of cool air to the space. You're going to overcool just as quickly, but during the time that you're overcooling, your supplier temperature is colder. So what's your dew point? Lower. So you're taking more humidity out of the air. So you're taking more humidity out of the air. Okay. Still not a perfect application especially on a single stage, single speed unit. But if we got 20 minutes of run time at 47 degrees versus 20 minutes of run time at 55 degrees, which one's better? 47 degrees all day long. <coughs> better, not perfect, <coughs> better. Do you want 
draw that out on the site chart. I've got a couple, I think I'm with you, but maybe not all the way. <coughs> yes? Okay. So let's grab our site chart. Let's use, um, let's use that dot point, okay, 78 at 65. And follow your cooling coil line down to 55 degrees, and then follow it down to 50 degrees. Find the difference in dew point temperature. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the difference in humidity ratio between the air cooled to 55 versus 50. Everybody know what they're looking for? No. <laughs> All right, one cool. more time. Let's just play yeah. it one more time. One more time. <laughs> Take. And use the index point. And we're going to cool that air to 55 degrees. Note the humidity ratio. And we're going to follow the same line, but we're going to go to 50 and note the humidity ratio. Okay? I got 60 and 50, okay? So let's take this room, let's pretend there's five tons of load on it. There's a five ton compressor, five tons of load on a full load day, everybody's happy. Poof, presto changeo, it's a rainy, cool day outside, now there's two and a half tons, okay? That unit is still gonna supply five tons to the space. It's going to supply it at 55 degrees because that's what it was designed for on the full load day. Suddenly now we're able to vary the supply fan speed and we can go to half speed. We're still supplying five tons, we're still going to overcool. We're still going to overcool at the same rate. Five tons is five tons is five tons. But the supply air was colder when we varied and slowed back. So when we take the 50 degree mark at the lower dew uh, humidity ratio and we do a mixed air condition with 75 and 50 percent because that's what we were aiming for, we draw a line between them versus if we draw a line from the 55 degree supply air back to 75 to 50, we're on a lower line, okay? We're on a lower mixing condition. So even though we overcooled just as quickly, we may have ended up in a more comfortable condition. You see that? <laughs> we, just, we just changed the discharge air count, basically by slowing the airflow down, mm -hmm. okay? Colder. Another thing it did, if you're using DX application, you just dropped your saturation temp in the evaporator considerably. That's true. Okay. We're probably close to the freezing point. You just agitated chill water and you without saying it, Mark. Uh, I'm just you're making, making a statement. statement. You're making a habit. I'm making a statement. <laughs> The reason why is because we do this every day and they do exactly that. Okay? You want that, right, Brett? <laughs> We're doing exactly that. They're creating DX 
single zone VAV systems. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're, we're doing. We're, we're creating a, a low back refrigerant temp. And then in order to get to that discharge air temp that we're looking for, we're creating a possible frost condition. Absolutely. Yep. We gotta be careful, right? So yes, I like the chill water, but we have to do it with DX sometimes. They can't make a two ton chiller out there. At least not that's cheap. Um, so we can vary this condition using BAS, right? We can reset that based on what the space relative humidity is telling us. If we figure out that we're driving the space to 40% RH, there's no reason for that. We can reset warmer. Okay. All right. I think eventually we're going to go really high tech. I just want to let you know. You're not going to see it yet, but they're going to have a suction pressure transducer, and it's going to grab that data, and it's going to look at that pressure convert that to temperature and it's going to try to hold the temperature it will not frost the coil so it'll be right on the margin <clears throat> and it's going to hold it there but it's going to also control the superheat and everything else but it's going to observe that and see how low it can go to create the condition he's talking about with the are you talking about cold temp i'm talking about evaporator refrigerant temp because it can only go so low you can go below freezing and not frost believe it or not but not very much, very long. So it has to calculate all that. So they're gonna be most microprocessors. And so it's gonna get really complicated, but we used a psychometric chart to see how far we can go to create good conditions. And then we're gonna to have to create a microprocessor for the, for the operating system so that it won't overshoot and put itself in jeopardy. Protection. Pardon? Protection. Yeah, it'll have all the protection. So it, it's, what, we, what do we do right now? We have what? We have a frost stack. What does it do? Protects from it turns the machine off. You're not going to get any condition like that. It's going to work. We want the machine to run. So train is hard to stop a train. We're going to create a non-stopping condition where they put a pressure transducer on it, and then they observe the temperature of the coil as well as the saturated temp down the road, and it's going to microprocessor. It's going to say, I'm going to go as low as I can go without hitting a condition where I have to shut it off on frost stack and create the condition that he's asking for for single zone VAV. Does that make any sense at all? Mm -hmm. We're gonna be there eventually. It's not there yet, but I can, I can tell you, if I was designing them, I would already have that in there, believe it or not. So you don't have to worry about it. As long as you know the pressure transducer and the sensor and the coil in the proper locations are working right, I can create this condition with DX to a degree. So when we're testing our equipment and we have BAS, <clears throat> Reset it. When, if I'm doing a maintenance, doing maintenance at a job, and I put it in test mode, and it's, can, I guess because some units you can't put in test mode due to the BAS, and put it at 100% to test, but the theory is if my unit runs correctly at 100%, then when it drops to these levels, it's supposed to run correctly. Like, if I'm running at 100%, and then, at, I go, the people are like, hey, at 50%, this unit isn't working the way it's supposed to be, then... So, 100% test point is the point you test at because it is the most repeatable point, right? Who's, who's put their jacket over a condensing unit in winter to get head pressure up, right? <coughs> Seen it, or your cardboard, or anything like that. Take the side panel off so it can't pull any air through the coil and then put it on the fan. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So the, the difference between operating right from a machine's perspective and operating right from a space perspective are two different things. So if the unit can operate correctly at full load, it's reasonable to assume that it is operating to the best of its ability <coughs> at part load reasonable assumption okay. maybe something wrong but you're on the right track for sure but that part load condition may not be satisfying the space so from the customer's perspective it's not working right so that's the kind of thing we're talking about here well what is right to you what's happening what are you trying to maintain this unit's running I can get the leaving air temperatures with two compressors running when it drops to one, 
obviously that leaving air temperature goes up. Doesn't go up as bad as if no compressors were running. Okay, but it's gonna cycle. This class is valuable because what I just said a moment ago, you'll need that on top of variable speed compressors to create the conditions you need, which 10 years ago we couldn't even touch. 10 years ago we didn't have a variable speed scroll. All of a sudden we got all kinds of variable speed scrolls, even down to little, I don't know, drinking fountain scrolls. So now we're gonna have some variables that you're gonna to have to try to figure out is it because they're not setting it up proper for this zone through psychrometrics? How are we gonna set this up? So that's why you have to have this class. It's gonna get worse and worse and worse. Yeah, so you, you, you're gonna to have to start getting into what, what, the, what the centrifugal guys and the, and the variable capacity chiller guys deal with all the time, and that's, and that's hunting, okay? So you got a variable speed compressor, and you're trying to maintain a 52 degree leaving air condition and it's, it's variable speed, but it's doing this. Okay. Means there's a setting in that system, okay, what, a, uh, what an audiophile would call gain, uh, what I would call dampening, what, just depends on what your background is, PI. but the piece of the PI controller that keeps you from overshooting. Okay, it's not tuned correctly. It should do something like this. Okay. Assuming the HVAC is a dynamic system, it's gonna change, the load's gonna change, but it shouldn't change rapidly. <laughs> but 15 people walk into a room where there was no one, it's gonna go off for a minute, but how quickly does it recover and how accurately does it recover? Okay. Those are the kind of tuning things that are coming to systems near you. But you need to know what that refrigerant temp needs to be to make a discharge air temp to create that psychrometric chart to cool that air. So when you see that we need to change that discharge air temp, we know we may have to change the saturated vat temp, meaning I have to pump less refrigerant or something to get it to that point or change the airflow. We got variable speed blower, ECM motors, we got all kinds of things now. And it's going to get really crazy down the road. To what? So I, I'm going to get out of the business. You guys, it's all on y'all. Okay. Sorry. So uh, something else that's really important, and you know, you're not going to have a whole lot to do with this piece other than making sure it's not happening. Okay? But if you're trying to control two things off of one input, it will never work. You try and control both fan speed and compressor speed off of space temp, it will never work because they're going to fight each other. Space starts overcooling, fan speed slows down, so does compressor. Whoops, we overshot. Now it's too warm. Whoops, we overshot again. What will happen is they'll they'll look at the relative humidity in the zone and they may back the fan off with relative humidity and they use zone temp to change the compressor speed. Other way around. But yes. I'm sorry, you're, you're right. I'm yep. right. Yep. Okay. Those two things will interplay with each other. It's okay if they're related, right? But you can't control two things with one output. Right. Yeah. So I can control fan speed off of, mm -hmm. off of space temp and I control compressor speed off of discharge temp. They're related. If I fix compressor speed and start slowing down, my, my discharge air temp is going to start dropping. That's okay. It's two different inputs. Now I start slowing down my compressor to, to compensate. Okay. But if in your, in your course of diagnosing a problem, you see that two things are being controlled. Talk talking about here. The difference between hot gas reheat and hot gas bypass. Okay. This is one of the most commonly... Fluctuated terms out there. Hot gas reheat takes the hot gas discharge off the compressor and runs it through a coil after the cooling coil and provides free reheat. Remember, we talked about how cool reheat is awesome. Okay, this is free cool reheat. The unit controller prioritizes space temp over percent RH. Okay, 
So, for example, we've got a 10 ton two stage unit with a hot gas reheat coil. Space temp is above set point. Set point 75, we're at 78. It is going to run as a standard cooling unit. When space temp gets below dead band, let's call it a two degree dead band, so it gets to 73 degrees, it would shut off or stage down or whatever the unit controller would tell it to do. Okay? It's, but the relative humidity is still high. 60%, we've got a set point of 50%. It's going to stay in two-stage cooling and energize the reheat coil. It's going to open a solenoid, and it's going to start running hot gas off the discharge of the compressor through that coil, and then it's going to meet up with the rest of the hot gas, go through the condenser, stand the refrigerant circuit. I love hot gas reheat. I think if it is energy code in this city that we have to put economizers on package units. We know, we learned today, that today is a day that works. Today is a day that helps. The other 8,700 run hours of the year, hot gas reheat helps because instead of continuing to push the thermostat down to try and get comfortable, it clicks into reheat and we can stay comfortable at a warmer space temperature because we're removing more moisture. Okay, there's two versions. If you're on a Reliatel controller, it's gonna be on off. Okay. It's either, the solenoid's either open or it's not. There's either refrigerant going through it or there's not. On an IntelliPak and on KCC units, it's got a modulating control. I'll be totally honest, I don't exactly know how that works, okay, but it's going to modulate to maintain a discharge air temp. And Addison's. Addison's too. Voyager Anybody? I think Voyager 3's, I think. Okay, Voyager 3's may have switched. They didn't used to be, but I believe that they've switched. Them, yeah. Okay. I believe that. I don't exactly know refrigerant wise how that works. I trust you guys to either know or figure it out with the factory support if there's a problem with it. Obviously, modulating always greater than on off, right? It's always better to be able to modulate something than to either have it or not, but having it is better than not having it. So I ran some selections in TOPS. TOPS is the program that we design train equipment in. So this was a five ton precedent unit. My design entering condition 7865, 95 degrees outside. In that real condition, it's probably unlikely high gas reheat would even be needed, but just pretend with me for a second. Okay, leaving the coil, we're going to come off just below 55 degrees. If the dehumidification is on, if we're, if we're running refrigerant, then that leaving air temperature comes up to 75 degrees. Okay, so we're picking up 20 degrees of sensible heat. If you're trying to maintain a space at 75 degrees, and you have the capability of having 75 degrees supply air. Can you overcool it with the reheat on? No. No. So if it starts to get a little warm, reheat clicks off, cooling continues. Starts to overcool, reheat comes back on. <clears throat> Holy cow. Imagine trying to maintain 75, 50% with that unit. Can we do it? Mm -hmm. Probably pretty well. Probably pretty well. Little, some squiggles in the line. There's going to be squiggles in the line. Yeah. <clears throat> DX, there's going to be squiggles, but can on average we be comfortable? Yeah, but they're not going to be traumatic, traumatic swings. No, no, of course not. Now, one thing to remember from the, from the persons in the space perspective, now you're probably not getting a call because the space is probably comfortable. The person in the space who has no idea how this unit operates probably is going to say something like, and then suddenly the cooling will just turn off. 
go look at the unit, you find out there's a hot gas reheat coil, and you can come back and diagnose, ah, there's a dehumidification with what was doing that. Okay. So this is what it would look like on a site chart. I apologize how messy this looks. But here's our mixed air condition, 7865, I think it was, coming down to 55, reheating back. Again, we're not going to be overcooling with this. Right. This includes the outside air. Okay, on a cool rainy day, I dropped my mixed air airing condition to just below 70 at 63. Relative humidity about 72%. Still a five ton unit. It's making five tons. Actually, it's probably making a little bit more. 67 degrees. Okay. So now I'm cooling down to 50, 49, 50. Click on that reheat, 71 degrees. Probably still going to be able to maintain a 75 degree space pretty well. Right? Even if all we think about it is slowing down the rate at which we overcool the space. It's going to take a long time to overcool a 75 degree room with 71 degree air. This time I was kind enough to include the outside of the mixed air happening. So we got way over here, right? All of our application hours that were along this. Okay, so this is a very realistic condition. We mix it here, we come way down the curve. We read. Okay. Different version of the cool rainy day. Actually, kind of an iteration of the cool rainy day. Space keeps getting a little bit cooler. It's not my entering Dry bulb 7259. Whew, that's getting pretty chilly coming off that coil. 4645, that's what we would be supplying on this day if we didn't have reheat. I think it would overcool that room in a hurry. I think we would get much runtime on the compressor. Now we're getting up to 68. It's not as good as it was before, but we're still going to take a long, much longer time. We're going to get a lot more runtime. You can tell I like hot gas reheat. Yeah. Here's what the condition looks like on the side chart. Going way back up there with the reheat coil. Wow. Meanwhile, hot gas bypass. We're going to take hot gas off the discharge of the compressor and inject it one of two places, either the inlet of the cooling coil or the inlet of the suction line. Short circuit on the compressor. Okay. There's disadvantages to each of these. If you insert it at the inlet of the cooling coil, you're going to reduce the capacity of the cooling coil, which was your intent. You're false loading the compressor. You're making the cooling coil think it has more load going across it than it does. But it helps keep it on. But because we've warmed up our coil, we have actually reduced our dehumidification capability because the coil is warmer. Cold coil pulls out more moisture than energy always moves from high to low. In a core, what that looks like is we've got outside air coming in, coming across, and going to your unit. Our stale air from inside the building is crossed and come out. They never actually touch, okay? There are membrane plates in between that exchanges that energy, okay? If you've ever seen a plate frame heat exchanger for water, it's the exact same idea, but it's a membrane that allows moisture to cross if it's a total energy core, or it's an aluminum plate and it only allows sensible energy to cross. That's a core right there? That's a core. And those, those located inside a package unit? You could, uh, you could mount it. Uh, next to the package unit mm -hmm. and duct it into the outside air intake. Mm -hmm. You could uh, mount it above the ceiling in line with an exhaust fan and close the outside air damper on the unit and just 
ducted in to meet and go up through the return to the package unit. There's lots of ways to get it into the unit. They're being built into the CSAA climate changer air handler as well. Yep, yep, you're gonna as, see them. As a component. What's that? Lonza Plaza. Lonza, they're all over the place. So you had to okay. fix those. Yep. Okay. They had them put in back. Nice. There's a, there's a couple different manufacturers of them. They all work relatively the same. My, my only complaint with this slide is that we don't use the term fresh air, use the term outside, outside air. air, okay? Just because it's from the outside does not necessarily make it fresh. We live in a very populated, somewhat polluted city, okay? So the engineering term that people like to hear is outside air, not fresh air. You could conceivably have more carbon dioxide coming in hmm. than's in there. And other things mm -hmm. So that's why I have carbon dioxide detection systems and everything. He's a mm -hmm. big, yes, it's possible. Only uh, if you've got, got, got capture. The ice cream plant's got a lot of carbon dioxide floating around that place. <coughs> oh, inside. You can have more inside than outside. Yeah, in most All, cases. Ev every single time. Yeah, but I thought you, you were talking about you see, You can yeah, see your intake place. is next to the loading dock. That's, that's what I'm telling you. Say. Is, is there to, there's scenarios where you still have to know that the difference wow. in the carbon dioxide are created. Go ahead. There's three types of desic desiccants out there, okay? The enthalpy wheel, that is the wheel version of the core we just talked about, okay? Uses a type one, okay? Don't worry about it as far as how it works. There are type two desiccant wheels. If you've seen like a Munter's unit, that's got a gas-fired heater, okay? The easiest way to tell whether or not it is a, there are two easy ways to tell whether it's gonna be a type two or a type three desiccant, okay? Type two is gonna have some form of intense heat going across one quarter of the wheel. Okay. You're trying to dry up the desiccant, dry that's what that is. Okay. The type three is going to be split 50-50 and there's going to be there may be a source of heat, but it's not going to be nearly as intense. And we'll talk about both of those a little bit more. There's a difference. Go ahead. Okay. You, you got it. So the big, big thing here is the ability for the desiccant to hold moisture. Okay. Where it's low, the wheel is going to give up the moisture. Where it's high, it's going to absorb the moisture. Okay. So on a type two desiccant, if you just heat the absolute bejesus out of any air, what happens to its RH? Drop, drops, drops like a rock. Drops. Mm. So if we get it hot enough, I don't care what the inlet condition was, it could have been in the Amazon rainforest, we will get it to the point where it gives up its moisture. Okay, and that's the goal of the one quarter side, which is wringing the moisture out. So that on the three quarter side, we're sucking it up. Sucking it up, sponging. Sponge, okay. On a type three, it's pretty flat, its ability to hold moisture through most of this relative humidity. And then all of a sudden it spikes, okay, above about 80%. Where in an HVAC system is the relative humidity always above 80%? On the uh, supply side of the coil. Exactly. Discharge the evaporator. Okay. Discharge the evaporator, we're always 95%, 100%, like that, right? Plus, you get to the coil. Yeah, closer to 100%. So it's going to hold moisture really well off the discharge of the coil. It's going to suck it up. And then all we got to do is on the other side, we just got to get it down here so it gives it up. Okay. So here's what an energy recovery wheel does. Exact same thing as the core. All we're doing is exchanging that moisture. We don't have a lot of time. I don't want to spend too much on it. If for some reason you're working on a unit, with an energy recovery wheel on it, and it's got a VFD, and the VFD has died, they don't have to buy a new VFD. The only real reason to have a VFD on these is for frosting in the winter. We spend so little time there, and when they're spending time there, you don't really need the wheel. Hopefully they put in bypasses, those bypasses just need to open. Okay. We spend so little time there, it's not worth the VFD. In other words, they're going to bypass the wheel, period. Okay. Passive desk and CDQ, type 3 wheel. Okay. We mix outside air and return air. We get 
uh, a mixed air condition, we go across the wheel. In this condition, the wheel should be giving up its moisture to the airstream, okay? which means we should be less around less than 50% RH, somewhere in there. There's a heating coil here, just in case we need a little bit of heat to get over that hump. Super humid day, not great conditions inside, we may need a little bit of heat to get there, not much. Okay. Should be picking up some moisture here. Fan, cooling coil, cold, get it cold. If they're doing this, if they have a wheel, there's a critical dew point D uh, application. So get this cold, it's gonna be north of 95% RH and this wheel's gonna suck it up. Blue bell? Blue bell. Hobby does it. Okay. Uh, hobby, yep. Operating rooms. Perfect for operating rooms. Squire. Uh, Train was one of the only people to use the, this technology for a long time. It's now much more readily available in the market. Okay, but most times you see this, it's going to be a red wheel branded CDQ, cool, dry, quiet. Okay, that'll be sitting in a training room. They still make those in Fort Smith, don't they? And in Lexington. Well, now soon to be made in Columbia, South Carolina. No, oh. where do they make the coils? Uh, all air handler manufacturing is moving to Columbia. All right, that'll make it look good. Okay. okay. So this is what a passive desk wheel looks like on a psych chart. We've got our outside air, our return air, we mix. We may need to heat that air up. It's showing it as being needed to heat up. Okay, that's that first heating coil we saw in the unit. Right here, we're just heating it up so we get down to 30% RH, okay. The drier you drive this, the more absorption it has down here. Okay. Goes through the wheel, picks up moisture, and cools. Go through the coil, go through the wheel again. It war the air warms up when it gives up moisture, which is part of the natural process. So, remember when we talked about this? This is the warmest temperature air that we can use to maintain space at 70% 50, 60, 50. We need it 40 degrees using mechanical cooling only, right? Ignoring sensible heat ratio. Okay. If we, we can do this with 50 degrees off the coil in a CDQ wheel, instead of 40 degrees mechanical cooling only, okay? to maintain 60 to 50 percent. This is that operating room condition. It's a lot easier to get a coil to do this than it is to do this. A lot less energy. A lot less energy. So this is from the train selection program for CDQ wheels. Mixes in. So here, we're coming off the coil at 51 degrees. We've got a dew point of 50. Now our dew point's 43.4. We went from 52 grains of moisture to 41 grains of moisture, 41.7. Just have a look at it. Okay. Here's our sensible heat ratio. What I, you know, we tweaked it so we're coming out to this mixture of condition. So instead of having to get this cold, or however cold you need to get, you have to get nearly this cold. <clears throat> so we have changed it from 120 to 140. Don't get confused between the two types of wheels because you can have the two types of wheels in the same unit. Total energy recovery wheel. Okay. There's our cool dry air that we're exhausting. Right. We know it's cool and dry because we're using a freaking CDQ wheel over here. We know it was good conditioned air. Okay. Put it there. So we do a sense. So we do a total energy exchange here. 
right? We get some of that energy in this air to move to this airstream. Okay? The air doesn't change airstreams, the energy does. Small amount of cross-contamination with wheels, not much. Cores, none. Then we go through our dust coat. These guys are gonna spin. You're gonna see them spinning. They spin pretty quick. These guys move like seven rotations an hour. These guys... Actually a little faster than that, but we're gonna say they're really slow. You almost get to work with an eye on them. Yep. If you're not sure it's turning, just watch it for a minute. Look for that stamped CDQ so you got something to track. Yeah. These guys are going to be spinning pretty quick. So an active wheel, this is that type 2 desiccant. Okay. Munters, CDI. <coughs> CDI is the, the psych chart that I've had up here. Manufactured out of Minnesota, rival the Munters. So you've got the reacted air, it's just outside air that they suck up, run through, in many cases, an indirect uh, direct fired burner, right? We don't care whether or not it's encapsulated, you just heat it up, cook it, cook it, okay? And so when we cook it, it's going to release that moisture and it's going to blow it out. Meanwhile, the other three quarters of the wheel get to absorb moisture. Thank you. Can you go back one slide, please? Yeah. Can you measure the CFM coming off one of those energy wheels? Yes. Um, so there's a couple different ways to go at it. The easiest is in most places where they're going to use an application like this, they're monitoring their air. Okay. In many cases, this fan has a Piat tube set on it. Hopefully, it's being pulled into the BAS. That fan. Okay. They may be measuring their outside air. Uh, they're almost certainly measuring their outside air intake. Okay, that's the piece they really care about. And then there's probably just a relationship, positive pressure that they're trying to maintain. And this is very, to maintain that positive pressure. So the exhaust in many cases floats. It'll be no, mostly reactive just based on the differential set point, not necessarily critical CFM off the exhaust. Right. The exception to that is super high tech lab spaces. Okay where you've got like a Phoenix system or something well, like they, that. They require so many foot above working level for mixing air. Like, uh, what do you call it, pathology labs and yeah. things of that nature where they're working under a hood yep. type of situation. Yep. So in those cases, mm -hmm. there's probably a measurement of the exhaust air somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. In most applications, this is reactive to building pressure. This is controlled to whatever's required. Okay. There's a Desham system too. You see mm, one yep. of that? Yep. They're monsters. So, in something like this, we've got a mixed air condition. Okay. That wheel's really hot. It's off the chart. You just need a bigger chart. <laughs> we just heated the quarter of that wheel up really, really hot. It doesn't instantly cool. So that air on the production side, the three-quarter side, when it goes through, it's going to get really hot too. Okay? Which means it takes a lot of coil to cool it back down. Okay? But it's a sensible coil. Right? I mean, it's not removing any moisture at that point. It's so dry. It's below the dew point of the coil. We don't see that very often. Cooling coil running and no moisture coming off of it. Where do you see these? This is a pretty generous slide from somebody trying to sell CDQ systems. Okay. Yeah. Um, where we see CDQ systems are hospitals, museums, and libraries. <coughs> Labs, mostly that. Okay. So we're talking about what about the Smithsonian, right? What about 
the NASA record vault that has the actual, if you know, I was assuming you're not a conspiracy theorist, the actual original landing, you know, from Apollo 11. Okay. They don't want the original to degrade. It's in a vault with very, very dry air. I've seen desk consistence on ice rinks quite a bit. Sure. It looks like CDQ is pretty much taking control of it right there. I mean, it just depends on whether the the guy who's selling to the engineer sells type three or type two wheels. Yeah, and actually those top three all go into the desk system depending upon their usage. The laboratory, dryer, storage, and ice rinks, all three are heavily into desk consistence. The lab or especially the rare books. That's right. That's why it's heavily into it. It's the only one that's heavily into it, museum and library. So, mm -hmm. but um, there's a Deschamps system down there at the ice rink in Beaumont. There's two of them, monsters out there that are definitely desiccant systems. It says schools, right? I think that's kind of a funny one, right? yeah. considering how we treat most of our schools around here. But if you were really, really going to design a badass school system, put the outside air for the school on a desiccant system, supply super dry air direct to the space, and then just have a local BRF, PTAC, water source heat pump, package unit, that its job is just to maintain temperature. Run at a dry coil. Our problem with desiccant wheels is uh, the smog here. You put something like that in, they don't change the filters. Two months later, the filters caved in and the core and the wheels are plugged up. Yeah. And we run into a different problem. Yep. Yeah. Gotta maintain them. And the problem was is that that system was never designed to be able to make its dew point without that wheel. Right? So that wheel needs to operate. So it needs to be maintained. You need to have good filter maintenance on it. You need to vacuum them. If they get really plugged, they can be taken taken out and washed. Okay, you and I can probably pull a wheel out. We wash it. This room couldn't put it back in. It's desiccant. It sucked up all the water. Okay, so you gotta leave it somewhere where it can dry out. These would come out in pie pieces. They're they're not one great big wheel. They're pie pieces that go together. It's like pie pieces in a pie when you take them out. Really? Well, yeah. It depends on the glue. The pie pieces were glued in. Yeah, they don't. They don't want to come out. So. Well, I can. I can tell you. There's. We got. Uh, we probably have 40 CDQs at Prairie View A&M, and some of them are 20 feet in diameter. Oh. Uh, yeah, I've seen them. If you try to take pie those pieces. out, they're not coming out in pie pieces. You ain't get them out. I do a lot of work there for you to straighten that mess out. That's all I've got. Man, you did a hell of a job. Thank you, everybody, for a lot of good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Those wheels need to be looked at at least every 30 days just to make sure everything is going the right direction. There's all kinds of variables that we didn't talk about. It's a, it's a unique one. We're not going to get in there and uh, float it out like a You're going to rust it out. You, you, need a, you need a whole bunch of Charlies. Yeah. You can just kind of walk in there and just like vacuum it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll honestly, you're gonna you're gonna treat you're gonna treat the air. You're gonna filter the air. I don't know what's on your quiz, so I don't know if I helped or not. You don't want you don't want to have unfiltered air. Oh, this is a critique. Oh, that's a critique. Awesome. Even better. Critique filled out because.